Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Varun Sriram with Generation UCAN and absolutely thrilled. It's, it's marathon season, so we are talking how to get race ready for your half marathon, for your full marathon, and I've got two wonderful guests with me joining me today. I've got Kelly Shalal, registered dietitian and personal trainer. Kelly, how are you doing today? Good, how are you? Doing great. Thanks for being here. And we've also got Coach Greg McMillan, uh, running coach, veteran of running. He's coached thousands of athletes or marathons, half marathons, you name it. Greg, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. And uh, Kelly and Greg both coming to us from Arizona. So uh, we've got a mostly western part of the U.S. show today. Mm -hmm. I'm here in California. You guys are in Arizona. Uh, enjoying some nice weather, but we've got a lot of people, whether folks just run Chicago or folks that are getting ready for the New York City Marathon coming up here in a few weeks, um, ready to brave the cold perhaps and, and run those marathons. So uh, before we really dive into the meat of our topic, uh, Kelly and Greg, just wanted to give folks in the audience a little bit of a chance to get to know both of you. Um, so Kelly, we'll start with you. What is your connection to the running world? Uh, what got you interested uh, in being a runner yourself, and then um, just to add to that, um, your experience in, in the nutrition uh, space as well. What what drove that passion for nutrition? Oh, that's a complicated question. <laughs> you know, um, I, I you know I was involved in sports in high school, and as you transition to college, if you're not continuing on in sports, and my sports were like dance, cheer, gymnastics, etc. Right, those things are hard to continue on. So I started running. And at first, it was just a little bit, and then I just kind of kept up, kept up, kept up, um, until I decided to start training for my first half marathon. As far as getting into nutrition goes, that was also a rocky path, you know. I um, I always like to tell people I did not grow, I grew, well, I grew up in a home where either there was lots of fried spam and canned green beans or it was drive through so I had to teach myself how to cook I had to teach myself what was healthy um, I made a lot of mistakes along the way but I learned a lot along the way I was a first a business major and then eventually ended up with a master's in public health of nutrition so uh, I really grabbed onto it once I realized nutrition was a thing in the world <laughs> it was something you could study and I uh, really loved it and just gravitated towards it and just wanted to learn everything that I possibly could and today. Well, we're uh, excited to have you and your expertise uh, on here today. And I should mention Kelly, also a uh, contributor for Runner's World. And I know you were uh, featured in there in one of their recent magazines as well. Um, Greg, for you, um, as I mentioned before, you've been uh, involved in the running world in, in numerous capacities for, for several years now. What, what brought you um, to the sport of running? And, and what keeps you excited to still be involved in running today? Well, I started running quite young and ended up running in high school and was state champion there and then ran in college and then continued to run afterwards, uh, continued to compete, was national marathon champion at the trail marathon when I turned 40, uh, still race and compete and uh, I really enjoy the sport from several aspects. I, I certainly enjoy the competition mainly in my own head, uh, competing and trying to get the best out of myself. But I also use running as uh, more my, my alone time, my time to think about things, to kind of get away and uh, work through life's problems too. So it really, for me, is a holistic journey of not only just the competitive side of things, which I really enjoy, but also just more of the health, fitness, and wellness side of running. And you know, from that, kind of like Kelly mentioned, you get into something and you just want to learn more. And so ended up studying exercise science, went to graduate school for that. So I enjoy sort of the hows and the whys of, of the way the body works to improve performance. And if you do that and you're a decent runner, then people start asking you for workouts and training plans. And suddenly I was a coach and then been really lucky to work with athletes who are just getting started, you know, charity marathon groups even you know cardiac rehab patients so very beginning type exercisers to lots of age group athletes a ton of Boston qualifiers we had almost 900 athletes in Boston last year or this past April uh, and then have even coached athletes to national championships the world championships and the Olympic Games so a lot of really diverse uh, opportunity to work with runners and for me, just like Kelly, it's just fun to have a passion that you can share with other people and help them along their journey. 
And I think for both of us, that's what we, that's why we're here is to just try to share that passion, our knowledge for that individual to try to help them toward their goals. Well, that's great. And um, I think you said it here uh, best, you know, the, for the folks that are here in the audience, um, what Greg just said, that that's why we have Kelly and Greg here together to help share the knowledge that they've accumulated uh, with all of you. So um, let's, let's get rolling. You know, our topic today is how to get race ready. And um, I want to add that whether you're somebody that's thinking about signing up for a race, you may have just signed up for your first race, or you've got a marathon like York coming up in weeks, maybe you have a marathon coming up this weekend. Uh, really here over the next 45 minutes, um, I want to assure you that whatever of those buckets you fall in, there will be something here for you. Um, so we're going to breeze through some of these areas a, a little bit quickly, um, but we will hopefully have time in the end um, for some of your questions, which you can feel free to chat live to us here on the uh, GoToWebinar app. Um, so starting out, uh, Greg, I'll, I'll start pose this one to you first. Um, for somebody that's got bit by the bug, you know, maybe they've run some 5Ks and 10Ks, now they're thinking, let's move up in distance and, and tackle a distance race. What are sort of the checklist of a few things that people need to know before jumping into this or before really doing this right? Well, they need to get a plan first because it's always helpful if you have an idea of, of how to structure your training and your workouts to build you toward your end goal. So I'd say find a training plan first. The second is understand how to execute the workouts within that training plan because running, even though it's a, such a simple sport, right? It's right, left, right, left, and just do that quickly. Uh, but it can be more complicated in how you sequence the workouts and then learning your body and particularly how to take care of your body because the number one thing that really cuts runners short in achieving their goals is injury and we get injured in our musculoskeletal system so we really need to learn how to take care of that uh, so I would say get a plan learn about the training plan itself and how to execute it and listen to your body and then really establish a good habit of the non-running stuff taking care of your body eating right getting rest and understanding that uh, the, it's a process to get to the finish line. It's a process to get to the starting line. And so live through that process. It really just takes a little bit of pre-planning, some motivation. And then if what's the best part of it, of course, is that every weekend there's somebody that was just like you who thought they could never do it, that they're doing it. So it's the path is set. We know we can do it. It's just get on a plan learn how to execute the plan, take care of the body. You'll get to the starting line healthy, and then you can get to the finish line faster. So, Kelly, uh, with uh, last year, you undertook your first half marathon, ran your first half marathon, um, I believe either last year or two years ago. So did you do everything that Greg just described? I did this last time, but as we talked about before a little bit earlier, I did not the first time that I trained for a half marathon. So the first time, and so that would be what I would add to Greg, is think about your nutrition and what your goals are, probably before you even sign up for that race, right? There's a lot of times I'm working with two different subsets of clients, or maybe there's a combination of them. It's weight loss or it's performance, right? Or maybe there's a combination there. And that's going to change your nutrition needs throughout the training cycle. So for me, when I attempted to run my first half marathon, I did everything wrong. I didn't feel before. I didn't feel dur during. And it's because I was using it as a stress outlet uh, slash weight loss goal right before my wedding. And so of course I got injured and I wasn't able to run that first half marathon that I trained for. I mean, and I trained all the way up to like week 11, right? Of a 12 week or, you know, 15 week of a 16 week plan. I don't remember which one. Right. And then I ended up not doing it for fear of injury. And because I was already kind of injured before the honeymoon. <laughs> so you really have to think, what is your goal here? Is this the smart move? And then what is my nutrition needs? Because if I would really sat through and thought about it at that point, I may have decided maybe this isn't the best, you know, idea pre-wedding. When I did the second when I actually completed a couple half marathons last year, I knew the goal was performance. And that really changed how I fueled, right? And so you have to think before what kind of race you're signing up for, what's the distance, what's your training schedule like, and that will change your nutrition needs based on your goals. Greg, when Kelly was talking about, you know, sort of the length of time of training, um, and uh, you alluded to finding a training plan as well, um, from your standpoint, for somebody that's training for their first half marathon, let's start there. 
how long should that training really be uh, where you would be comfortable as a coach saying this person is ready? Well, it would depend on the athlete, right? If they were coming from scratch, then we're going to need more weeks than uh, if somebody already is coming off being able to run a 5K or a 10K, feeling like they have a decent amount of basic fitness. They're just not race ready. They're not ready to complete 13.1 or 26.2 miles. So for most of the uh, sort of newer runners who are getting into, they want to complete a half marathon or a marathon, that's more 16, 20, 24 weeks that we'd like to have to kind of slowly build toward the race. A fitter runner, they can get away with fewer weeks because obviously their base level of fitness is higher. So it depends a little bit on the athlete, but the nice thing about the body is that it can adapt and will adapt to the stress. You just got to give it enough time to do that. Uh, cramming the training, uh, crash training, if you will, is not the best plan, uh, in my opinion, to get ready for the race. So give plenty of time. I mean, now it's sort of, there's races year round. So you can always look ahead and say, oh, four months, five months, six months from now, I want to do this race, uh, but I want to build in a smart way. The other part of that is really good is if you do have weight loss goals, it allows you to be smart about your nutrition so that you can not be trying to train really hard for the race, but yet not fuel a lot because you're trying to lose weight and trying to play that game of balancing that, which I'm sure Kelly does all that, have to talk with athletes all the time. So I think a little bit more time for people just starting out and less time if you've got some basic fitness. Uh, Kelly, for you, uh, and maybe, maybe the answer is the nutrition, which you spoke about a little bit, but jumping into your first half marathon, what was the sort of the biggest surprise for you of, of the whole experience, you know, when you were training for it for your first time? Was there something that you didn't expect, something that might have been more challenging than you expected? Um, anything that stands out? Uh, I have, I think what I loved about training, and I think what many of us runners love about training is the goal orientedness of it, right? That was really more motivating. I had a goal every week to finish a certain amount of workouts, and I had a goal you know, every, at the end, right? Um, I think what surprised me is, if, you know, that first, the first time that I trained, what surprised me was how tired I was, given that I was already pretty fit, right? And again, we already spoke about that being lack of recovery and lack of fueling and lack of many things. Um, I think what surprised me this time around is how much, well, this time around by that, I mean last year when I completed those two, was how much easier it was. I mean, it was like a night and day difference with the fueling strategies that I use with my clients and everything that I had learned. And um, it was just, it was night and day difference. And it was just so much more enjoyable than just, than just goal oriented. That's pretty interesting. Uh, Greg, I, similarly for you, when you're training uh, first time athletes, which, you know, that are running a marathon or a half marathon distance for the first time, something that you've done a lot of, um, are there a couple things that stick out in your mind that in the process of the training, they come back to you and say, wow, this is really a lot tougher. or This is really presenting a big challenge for me. Any couple things that might stand out? Well, usually it's because they don't realize that um, life is complicated and we want to com compartmentalize, right? Like I'm doing this run and then I've got my work and I got my family and we don't often recognize that that's one big stress pie. And so sometimes people are now inserting into a very busy and stressful life training for a half marathon or marathon, and that's hard to do. And so a lot of times they will say, I didn't recognize that I actually needed to train a little bit less so I could balance that stress rest cycle better, feel better on all my runs, so the quality of my runs was better, uh, and then I would stay injury free, I'd get to the starting line healthy as opposed to feeling stressed about the running, not able to recover from the runs, the body starts complaining, I've got lots of aches and pains, and really it's not as pleasant as it could be. And as Kelly mentioned, when you get it right, it's a pleasant experience. It's a fun challenge, it's not always easy, but it's a fun challenge because you're stressing your body and your mind and then you're recovering, you're ready to do it again, and that works really well. So I think having a plan and understanding that it has to all fit within your life. And she mentioned it, we're also goal driven, like runners are just known for being so goal driven and they're usually goal driven in every aspect of their life. That sometimes that's why as a coach, I'm usually holding people back. I'm saying, well, let's do just a, a little bit less because look, you've got 
a big work project coming up. Why don't we lower the stress level and run? But I won't be ready for the race. Trust me, you'll be fine. It's the body of work that leads you to a strong performance. It's not one week or one day that makes or breaks the training plan. So recognizing that it has to flow and fit within your life is another thing that I hear a lot of times that can make it really hard to do the training or can make it go really well. That's interesting. Something that, you know, certainly Kelly mentioned off the top too, talking about training for her first half marathon while getting ready for her wedding. So I think it's a prime example of what um, you're just talking about, Greg, where life gets in the way sometimes of the goal and the, and the productivity of training. Um, so I think that's a lot of great background info for folks that are thinking of diving into this. Some good uh, feedback from Kelly, kind of what you did well and what you didn't do so well your first time, as well as from you, Greg, on what people should consider both in terms of what's going on in their life and how much time they need if they're doing this for the first time. Um, I want to move on to kind of our second topic of discussion here, which is really about um, coming up with the nutrition strategy and fueling for your race. And both of you guys already off the top have already um, alluded to nutrition. Um, Kelly, I want to start with you. In, in your um, experience as a dietitian and working with runners, what, what are some common misconceptions um, for new runners as they're trying to move up in distance and tackle the distance? What are some common things you might see that people think, hey, I need this now that I'm running, you know, X number of miles? So there are a lot of things, many of which I did on myself, <laughs> misconceptions, right? Uh, there are a lot of things, and I think you too may have alluded to some of them in past webinars. I was kind of creeping and listening to them. So interesting, by the way. Uh, but one of the common ones is the tendency to not – well, not consider the distance or type of workout because those are two different types of things, right? Because you can do a three-mile track workout and you can do a three-mile easy run, and those are two different types of workouts, and they require a little bit different fueling and refueling strategy. The other piece is just overall, regardless of the type of workout, really just overestimating how much you need to fuel or refuel for that for that workout. So, you know, people tend to just overestimate and overeat compared to their needs. And that we especially see that with new runners because they're not used to the distance and because it's a little bit harder than what they're used to, maybe they're overestimating it. Or on the flip side, I know we're going to get there, but with weight loss, you make the mistake of not eating enough and not recovering enough. And those two are the biggest ones, right? So it's always a challenge between over overdoing it or potentially underdoing it, depending on what your goals are. So, I, I mean, that those are probably the two biggest ones that I see. How about you, Greg? Um, perhaps some similar to what Kelly said. Um, anything, anything similar that you're also seeing? Anything different that you might see? Well, the, and I think she alluded to it. There's difference in athletes, right? So you'll have some athletes who are new and they start exercising. They say, "Oh, well, I'm exercising. I need to eat a little bit more." But they've been gaining weight before they started exercising, which clearly indicated they were already eating too much for what they were doing. So they probably don't need to eat more. They're probably fine. They may want to adjust how they eat around their workouts. And then you have the other extreme of people who are uh, really have a big weight loss goal. And so they're really restricting calories. But then the quality of their training will suffer because they're not um, you know, periodize, periodizing their nutrition around their key workouts. And I, I think that's what most of us are trying to do is look at, uh, okay, what your, your nutrition shouldn't have to be the same all the time. You might want to change it up a little bit based on the type of workout that you're doing. As Kelly mentioned, if you're doing a three mile easy run, you don't have to do anything special for that run. You've got all the fuel you need on board and your meal right after will be fine. You don't need to worry so much about that. But if you're doing a, a really intense workout, then that changes the scenario. And maybe that's where we need to be a little bit more prepared nutritionally. And certainly we want to accelerate recovery after with our nutrition because that's one of the key things we can do to get ready. So it's again, one of those, it depends. We're probably always saying it depends on the runner, but we certainly see that with runners where new runners often are overeating or rewarding themselves for a workout and so they're over consuming even though they have weight loss goals and then we have some high performance athletes who uh, maybe don't fuel enough and need a little bit more guidance on 
how to structure their fueling to improve the quality of the training. Because ultimately, we just want to improve the quality of the training. Because if we do that, your fitness is going to go way higher. You'll burn more calories while you're doing that run, and you'll probably perform better in the race. Staying on this idea of um, uh, topic of fueling, um, you know, weight loss is something both of you have mentioned and alluded to, and being in the midst of marathon season and a lot of expo, uh, being at a lot of expos personally, you know, it's something you'll you'll constantly you'll meet runners, they're trying to lose weight, or or you, you'll you'll even hear these certain things that have almost just come to be accepted. You know, people making statements like, "Oh, you can't run a marathon and lose weight at the same time." Um, I want to ask this to both of you. Like, wh where did that idea come from? Why, why is that such a commonly held belief um, from people that training a marathon for a marathon or training for an endurance event and losing weight don't go hand in hand? Kelly, I'll start. I'll start there with you. What do you, What do you think? Why? Why? What's the struggle people are finding, or, or in your eyes, why is that something that people tend to believe? So. It it really, again, you know, as Greg alluded to, we're going to be keep saying it depends. <laughs> but uh, really, I think when we're talking about weight loss, in any scenario, we're talking about balancing three different key components in order to make that happen. So one is you need a calorie def deficit, right? And so achieving that, ideally with running, is typically not very hard if you're, you know, if you're watching it. But the problem there becomes how you're feeling throughout the day can make it harder or easier to achieve that calorie deficit, right? So if you're under fueling right post run, depending on how long the run is, you may be extremely hungry throughout the rest of the day. And now that runger ramps up and you're overeating. And that's especially in the later stages of, of marathon or half marathon training. The other thing you have to worry about is balancing your blood sugar. So we probably should have alluded to this in the previous question, but your macronutrient balance is really important, right? And that is actually a mistake that I see a lot of athletes making is overdoing it on the protein and underdoing it on the carbs, especially with the goal of weight loss. And so that's making it really stressful on the body. It's creating an inopportune or not, you know, suboptimal nutrition strategy that has a lot of consequences that comes along with it. One of them being that you're breaking down protein into sugar if you're not giving your body enough sugar. And then now your muscles aren't getting refueled with that protein and it's not working the way that it should. And it's usually because of a weight loss goal. So, you know, overeating protein or on the flip side, under eating protein can be an issue too, right? So if you're, you know, dominant in any one macronutrient, you're not going to be optimal in your nutrition strategy. And so balancing blood sugar is a really key component, and that's where Generation You Can, of course, comes in when we're talking about fueling. We're talking about fueling prior to the run, during the run, depending on the distance, right, or even post-run, which I know you guys did a whole webinar on recovery, right? So balancing blood sugar, because if you've got that blood sugar spike and it's more than you can store in glycogen or use during that run, you're going to store it as fat. And so that blood sugar going up and down, up and down throughout the day also causes, you know, cravings. And it causes, um, you know, besides that storing the extra as fat, it's going to cause cravings and it's going to cause stress on the body. And so that's another reason. So now we have, a, you know, reasons why calorie deficits are hard, reasons why you're not able to maintain that steady blood sugar that's causing that fat gain. And then of course the biggest issue that I know you probably talk about with your runners all the time because I know I talk with them about, about it to mine is cortisol, right? So that's stress response. Your body's natural stress hormone is responding if you have too big of a calorie deficit. It's responding if your training is not correct, right, or you're not recovering, or you're um, just overstressing your body. And cortisol's job is to start mobilizing energy, but it also tries to store the excess energy because there's an issue going on where the body's too stressed out, and so it wants to be prepared for famine, in other words, or wants to be prepared, what I tell my clients, is to either run or fight the tiger, only we don't have tigers that we're running or fighting anymore, right? <laughs> we have sitting in car in our stressful cars and we have commuting and we have all that kind of stuff. And so when it comes to trying to lose weight, especially in the later half of half marathon training or marathon training, those longer distances, it can be challenging. 
And to be 100% honest, I don't always recommend it for my clients. What I recommend is we focus on weight loss in the beginning stages of training, and then we move to performance nutrition. And we can revisit weight loss after the race. But because of that cortisol response and needing to manage blood sugar and then the needing at those high levels, it can be extremely difficult to even just maintain weight, much less, you know, weight loss. And it's just, it will affect your sports performance. And that goes back to the very first thing we talked about was what is your goal with this race? Because that might determine whether you sign up for that 10K where we can maybe keep you doing weight loss the whole time versus a half marathon or marathon, right? So it just depends on um, what your goals are. So it's, it's absolutely true. It's not a myth. Uh, you know, any runner knows that that you know you're up against a lot when it comes to those later half of training but i think you would agree with me greg when you, when i say it's not absolute by any stretch of the imagination smart strategies will stop that from occurring and will definitely keep you able to maintain your weight um yeah greg i i was going to ask you um something based on what kelly said earlier but i, I did want to ask you about that point you made towards the end um when you're talking about weight loss training for a half marathon or a marathon, are, are you also, um, you know, coaching your runners to, to suggest that that's better achieved in the early stages of a training plan versus the latter stages? I saw you kind of nodding in agreement there. Yes, absolutely, because it makes complete sense, right? First, you're not training as hard, so you can achieve a calorie deficit and you're not going to have such a, a reduction in the quality of your training because the training's not that intense yet. So it's a perfect time from that standpoint. It also makes sense to try to get as light as you can early because that reduces the musculoskeletal stress later when you're running longer. I mean, obviously we would know, take 10 pounds away from you, that's a lot less stress on the body. So I'm a big fan of early in the plan, that's where you do your most uh, sort of weight loss oriented nutrition. And then when you get into the harder section, sort of the race specific, maybe, you know, eight to 10 weeks out from the race, that last bit there where you're doing your most intense, longest, hardest, voluminous training, that's where it's really tough to be restricting calories because then it's, it's almost Russian roulette where, you know, if you get it wrong, then your big run that you really wanted to do well in, you might not be fueled for. And so it really just introduces, I think, another kind of um, place where you can go wrong. So I'm a big fan of that. I love when people use their off season and early season as a great time to sort of, you know, achieve uh, their weight loss goals. So then we can just focus on fueling for performance for the remainder of the session. And I think a lot of new runners, and we hear this, right? They go through a marathon, a charity marathon group like I used to coach, and they're mad that they didn't lose any weight. And uh, you start going, well, you know, you can carry so many calories with you now that you can basically be replacing more than you're burning while you're doing the run. So you see people, we, we only burn about 100 calories per mile so if you do a 10 mile run, that's a thousand calories. But if you're taking four gels during that run, you've just sure. consumed, yeah. you know, you're, you're not getting the caloric burn that you want. So I think that plays a role in it as well as if people now just have so many calories, this fast acting calories that they're taking while they're actually doing the run. Uh, and that can complicate the idea of let's try to keep our caloric intake under control fuel properly so we have high quality training but not over fuel and then like I mentioned you know you'll do that run maybe over fuel during the run and then you go and say well I ran 10 miles so I'm going to go to the breakfast buffet and then you eat another 1500 calories and it's like well wait a minute the reason you're not losing weight is you actually just consumed a thousand more calories than you burned that morning it, you know that's going to be a problem and so uh, that's why I think smart nutrition across your training plan is so key, and particularly if you have weight loss goals, to make sure that you dial it in, uh, because it's it's easy, but it it just like training, right? It just takes some knowledge and some understanding of how to do it, so that you can be fueled correctly, not overfuel, not underfuel to the point where the quality of your training suffers. 
Um, you know, Kelly had mentioned um, kind of trying to avoid these blood sugar imbalances in the context of weight loss. You, Greg, just spoke about, um, you know, kind of the effect of these high glycemic fast acting carbohydrate sources, um, you know, in the context of, of weight gain or weight loss. Um, so, Greg, I just had a quick, just an aside for you, like, how did we get to this point in running, you know, where when you show up to the race, it's the bagel and the banana that's prevalent, it's the pasta dinner the night before, it's gels and sports drinks during, like, how did it come to this? Well, it came because originally in marathon running in the early days, they didn't use anything. And so they were maybe drinking some water, but as the first running boom started, and that was about the time that exercise science really became into, into its own, we started looking at runners as they were getting tired and saying, what's going on, what's missing? And we immediately saw blood glucose was low. And we all know if your blood glucose is low, you're grumpy, you're not able to perform as well. We noticed that muscle glycogen stores can be lower. So we know, okay, if you have really low muscle glycogen stores, it's very hard to perform in high intensity and long duration activities. So we, we started to get an, a picture of like what's going on in the athlete. So naturally the thought is, well, I need more carbohydrate, I need more sugar, I need my blood glucose to be higher, I need to store more glycogen, I need more of that stored carbohydrate. And that kind of began the movement toward uh, putting more carbohydrate in to your diet and then also can you put it in during exercise. And that started the process of how can you do it faster and get more in to try to balance this, this idea of, you know, averaging the muscle, the blood glucose level, given that you were doing a spike with shoving a bunch in, the body says that's too much, so it lowers it, then you have to dose again, so you kind of start the yo-yo. So I think that's what kind of started all, and it was very good intentions to try to address what was happening in runners, but we know that there are consequences to all of those actions. And so now, maybe 40 years later, we're hopefully a little bit smarter in how we can apply the concepts of you need carbohydrate to perform well, but you've got to do it in a smart way so that you avoid some of the issues that we've talked about, the spike in the crash. If you've run long enough and you've used high, fast acting carbohydrates, you've probably sometime missed the dosing regimen, so you've found you crashed and your performance suffered, or your uh, your GI system can only tolerate so much for so long and it's a changing environment as you get tired so all of a sudden you stop in fact I just had an athlete posted on our uh, in my coaching group uh, online and he stopped eating in this marathon after 25 K because his stomach was upset and it's like you know you can't do that you need the fuel for the remaining 11 miles he had to go in the race but the stomach got upset. So I think it's, it's kind of a combination of figuring out the fueling you need for performance, but doing it in a smart way that it works with the body. And that's one of the key things. And obviously we're here with you can. So we, we think that's a, a really great way to kind of fuel a bit smarter is that you can work with the body so that you do have a stable blood glucose, which keeps the brain happy, keeps some fuel available for the muscles. Um, and it avoids the spike and crash. It's a little easier on the gastrointestinal system. All of that works to our advantage. And I think, so that's a long way to answer your question. I think it came from us not having anything, figuring out what we needed, maybe going too far with uh, the, I, some of the concepts of how to get what you need. And now we're coming into a little bit better understanding of how to work with the body. Well, it's, no, it's interesting to hear your perspective on that because because you've lived it and you've seen you've seen the the change I guess both in mentality and and in the different offerings in terms of products as well. So so it's an interesting perspective um, to get from you and uh, you know in that context, Greg, you know both uh, you and um, Kelly alluding to to you can and, and keeping your blood sugar steady. I just wanted to take a moment for both of you just to kind of uh, ask you how you've uh, utilized it or, or athletes you've worked with have utilized it. Um, as part of their fueling plan when, when running distance. And um, just real quick for those um, in the audience that may not be familiar with it, when we talk about UCAN, uh, we're talking about it either in powder or in bar form, but it's really based on the same idea. It's a, it's a different type of carbohydrate. So 
Um, you know, we've talked about high glycemic and fast acting carbs. Um, with UCAN, uh, we use something that's unique to our product. We call it super starch, and it's very slow to break down. So just like Kelly and Greg alluded to, instead of giving you that quick acting sugar spike, it's something that can sustain your blood glucose level, sustain your energy on far fewer calories. Um, Kelly, I'll, I'll start with you. How did UCAN come across your radar and, and how uh, was it part of you, uh, your fueling plan um, for your race? So I was first exposed to UCAN when I worked at Lifetime Fitness as a personal trainer and registered dietitian. Um, and what was really cool about that was at, at once I was presented with a ton of research and a ton of current gym members and other people's clients who were using it and telling me how great it was. And now I always tell people you can does what all those other products say they do as far as a slow acting carb or slow releasing carb. This actually does that and they have the research to, to back that up, which is the coolest part. So I used it how I recommend it, recommend it for my clients for the most part. I typically, on most case scenario, I would use, or most case, most often, you know, always before a long run. So when I was training for those half marathons before the long runs. And when I say long runs, I mean over 60 to 75 minutes. I don't know if you would agree, Greg, but I say I, over 60 to 75 minutes is where I start talking about long runs with my client because clients, because under that, you know, whether it's a sports drink or it's anything else, we're not we're talking about different nutrition fueling strategies under 60 to 75 minutes, depending on what you're used to or what climate you're in and stuff like that. So uh, always I would use, you can the drink uh, before a long run and depending on, yep. So, and I'm a Cran Raz fan, fan but <laughs> he has that one, but uh, depending on how that, long that training session was. So if it was over the 75 minute mark, then I often brought a bar with me and I actually ate the bar on the long run, about halfway through or three fourths of the way through. Uh, I did not use any gels personally until much later in my training strategy. I think like once I hit double digits, so it was like 10 or 11 miles, right? Because for me, you can does the job of supplying me enough carbohydrate to get through that run, right? I don't feel those blood sugar up and downs. The only thing that happens to me is I get hungry. <laughs> and so that's where the bar really comes into mind. Or I would have the bar and the drink before when it got longer to the double digits. I'd have the bar and the drink because it was like five o'clock in the morning because in Arizona <laughs> and Phoenix, <laughs> we run when it's super hot at five o'clock in the morning. And that's a little bit different than race start time, which is difficult because race start time can be a little bit later and you always tell you know, as a runner and for my clients, I, you want to practice your fueling when you're training. And that's difficult when the race start time is a little bit different, right? And so for most of the training runs, I did the bar and the drink later on, you know, two or three weeks out. And then maybe a gel in at that point. So we're talking two or three weeks out, right? Um, and I did the same thing for the race. I just moved my nutrition a little bit closer to the time, but I don't get any GI upset. So for clients that do, that bar might not be, or food before might not be a thing, or I have people that can get up and eat whatever they want, right? So it just, it really depends as long as you're practicing training. But I think the best part about you can for the long runs is that it's so long acting that you've got almost like this baseline of support where you know that if you know one scoop for two hours or more for longer, you know that you've got that what I call a baseline of support, right? It's gonna keep your blood sugar stable and you can fuel in between that if needed, right? So when I got on those long runs, I needed that that gel at the end. But I was still getting that baseline of support. But just at that point, I probably burned through my glycogen reserves and probably wasn't pulling fat doors enough or whatever it is, right? So that's kind of how I used you can when it comes to shorter distance runs. It depends. I might use it more for recovery than fueling, right? Uh, when it comes to mid-distance runs, again, it depends. Is it a hard track workout or is it just a mid-distance easy run? It just depends. But the nice thing about you, Cam, is I don't worry about the not eating, eating thing because if I want it or I feel like I need it, I can have it and I'm still going to be doing what I want to do, which is burn fat and perform at my best. 
with you can and that's all because of the steady blood sugar that you're getting that's it's 100 percent it that's all because of that i don't even remember what the question was i feel like i just you nailed it. It. well you how did you i get how did i get in. on you can <laughs> but i love it for fifty thousand reasons but mostly because of that steady blood sugar that's just it's just amazing for that two points i wanted to just piggyback on i think you said something earlier where you were talking about um you know, kind of that, that influx of glucose um, in your system, how when, when you have too much, too much carbohydrate in your system, some of it gets stored away as fat. So one of the things you were talking about with UCAN by keeping you real steady, it's allowing that mobilization of fat. I think another point I just wanted to add was, um, you know, you talked about using the drink or the bar. Um, these are fairly interchangeable. Um, you know, there's some subtleties to it, but the drink, again, it's not a traditional sports drink. It's a little starchy in consistency. So like Kelly talked about drinking it before, uh, Greg, I know you talk about this a lot, but we really talk about it as feeding with you can, right? Treating the drink as if it's more like a food source. Um, so just similar, uh, similarly to you, Greg, you, you've kind of been at this with you can for, for a few years now and, and through your own experience, through the experience of your athletes, you've, you've kind of been able to refine the fueling protocol with you can. So in the race context, um, what are you finding that folks are having success with? Well, most people, uh, I, this is the rhythm I like to start with, which is 30 to 60 minutes before the start of a long race, something that's going to be a half marathon or certainly a marathon, let's say, then take a dose then, um, that's wonderful. And then once every hour through the activity is plenty because one scoop, so one serving, the packet that you showed, will get most people about an hour and a half of sort of steady energy. So if you're fueling every hour, then you're sort of making sure you're never getting too far low, too low, if you will. So you're not risking sort of running out of energy or the blood glucose dropping. So that to me makes your fueling strategy super easy. You have some right before 30 to 60 minutes. And then once every hour during your race, you have another feeding. I call it feeding. You have another drink or gel or whatever, however you've mixed it up and, and are using it. But you do that and that works great. Kind of, I like this baseline of support. That's a great thing that probably will provide you steady energy. You won't have a comp any complications with your GI system because you're not frequently kind of jamming in uh, things that can, are, are, can be difficult to digest as the GI system gets stressed with the activity. So that's a really great way to start using Generation You Can. And you can do it in practice. You can just start 30 to 60 minutes before one of your long runs, drink some, carry it with you or have a bottle stashed somewhere, drink it again once every hour. And you start to learn, you know, which flavors do you like, how concentrated can it be, uh, what's the delivery mechanism, and then how do you feel? And you can either have more or less depending on how you feel. How you feel ultimately drives the ship, right? It shows you, I feel good, I have energy, I have a lot of power at the end of this run, perfect. I don't have energy, I felt uh, un grumpy, I didn't feel strong at the end, you need more energy. So you can kind of fuel that way. To me, that's the simplest fueling strategy that you can have where you're doing feedings once per hour and then in between your your fueling your I'm sorry you're hydrate hydrating with water and electrolytes on a normal schedule that you would have but you're not having to try to do so much at one time that's our starting point and then with some experimentation we can usually figure out the exact regimen that will work and one of the things that I like about Generation You Can is you can have it mixed up as a drink. You can make it into a paste or a gel and carry that with you like a traditional gel. There's so many different ways that you can uh, carry it. So, so for me, um, you know, I just carry it as, as a liquid because that's enough for me. It'll last me through the duration that my marathon takes. Uh, if your marathon is, is fairly long, then you can't carry enough fluid with you, so you use it as more of a gel or a paste, and you guys have the videos showing how to mix that up, but lots of different ways. All you need to do is get the dose in once an hour, and you're usually good to go. Um, Greg, is it just a, um, as a follow-up to that point, um, in terms of carrying nutrition, you know, you're talking about people being able to carry UCAN with them, whether it's UCAN or not, um, carrying 
nutrition is something that you've been a proponent of um, as we're talking about fueling for a race. Um, you know, that's something you recommend to most of your runners. Am I correct? And if so, what's, what's the reasoning behind that? Well, it's, it, it, again, we're trying to simplify the nutrition plan during the race. And I just feel like being able to drink and eat what you want, when you want on your schedule is way better than getting into a situation where you come to an aid station, it's jammed with people, you've got to try to figure out, can you get enough fuel, which most people don't, and then maybe you're having to consume something that you haven't used in training. So to me, those are all things you're trying to avoid. You're trying to make the race less stressful. You're trying to make sure you get what you need and you want to do stuff that you've practiced. And so to me, just carrying, and now there's so many great vehicles for carrying, right? There's devices, all kinds of different packs and handhelds, and you can usually find something that feels good for you. So I just think that it helps make the race easier. So now you can run down the middle of the road and just bypass these crazy aid stations where people are fighting to get a drink and you can kind of fuel on your own strategy, what you're used to, what works for you. So for me, I think that makes a lot of sense for runners to again, make the, make the race uh, less stressful, easier on them. Um, that just keeps, keeps you focused on the race ahead as opposed to worrying so much about, am I going to get what I, what my fuel that I need? And, you know, as part of this discussion, we've had uh, a few people asking questions, um, as Kelly, you and Greg have both, both been talking here about this subject, um, just in regards to, uh, you know, I'm running a six hour marathon. Can you can be my sole fuel source? Um, and I think, you know, you heard it from both Kelly and Greg, like, absolutely can be it is for many people and you can do what Greg's talking about where you start with a scoop every hour if you're out there for a little bit longer and you tend to get hungry like you're out there for six hours you could Kelly was talking about mixing in a bar because she got hungry um, and then there's others that you know have a lot of success utilizing you can for the first whatever it might be 60 percent 70 percent of the race and then switching but even so they find that okay instead of six gels for the marathon they're taking two so it's really like I think the point that Greg hit on is, is really key. It's practice. You know, you, you got to practice. He's given you a baseline strategy to start with. You can kind of tweak it and, and work from there. And um, just one more point I'd want to make, you know, when, when they're both talking about, you know, this packet of you can lasting you perhaps up to 90 minutes. Um, as we've been talking about a calorie deficit in the context of weight loss, I mean, this is only 110 calories. So if you think about, you know, a hundred calorie gel and how many times you might need to take that relative to this, this can help you achieve that calorie deficit without feeling crummy during your runs, which I think, Greg, you said something along the lines that like, you have to feel good, right? You have to go by feel. And um, so that's something that you, when you play around with, you can, you can kind of compare the way you feel. Um, I want to move on uh, with the, to the final stage of our discussion, which is really talking about race week. So for those of us, uh, for folks who've got marathons coming up this weekend, uh, we've got Marine Corps coming up soon. Like I mentioned already, the New York City Marathon. Um, Let's spend uh, the last about 10 minutes we have here talking about race week. So, uh, Kelly, we'll start with you. Um, from a training standpoint, the week before your race, what, what did you do when you had success the week before your race in terms of training? For folks you're working with, what do you suggest that they do? From a training standpoint, well, personally, what I did was taper and actually tapered <laughs> versus what I wanted to do, which was not. <laughs> and the second time I tapered even more and it was great. <laughs> it was even better. Um, so, the, you know, rest, recovery and balanced diets right before your race. It is not the time to be stressing your body. Your body will know what it needs to do come that day if you continue a normal diet. So that is not the time, you know, if you're traveling, that's where it can be challenging for sure. I didn't travel for either of mine. They were both Phoenix. So I didn't travel for either of mine, but if you are traveling, I think that's where a lot of my clients like get a little iffy, like, Oh, but I want to go try all these restaurants while I'm there for the week before the race or, um, you know, and you have to be cognizant of, you know, just like we were talking about with the gels, like what is, how's your body going to react to that? You don't know. Maybe you have a stomach of steel and it's fine, but you don't necessarily know that. Um, 
And then the other thing I did was move from, at the beginning of the week, comp very, very complex fibrous carbohydrates, which is what I typically consume, you know, generally a lot of cruciferous vegetables and things like that, and, you know, starchy sweet potatoes and just whole grains and things like that, and move to a little bit less fibrous vegetables as you get closer to that day, right? So maybe take out the cruciferous and go with some zucchini or something that's a little less rough on the GI system. Uh, I, I can personally keep in whole grains, but my clients have to kind of experiment with that. Most of them are fine, but there are some that would just do better with maybe white rice or, you know, they just get their carbohydrates get a little bit simpler, but that doesn't mean we're eating candy all week, right? It means we're still eating healthy, nutritious foods, but they're getting a little less complex and a little simpler um, as far as keeping those glycogen stores topped off. Uh, as and I don't know if that's something we want to talk about now or... Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I, you read my mind. I asked you training, but I meant nutrition, so I'm glad you took it in that direction. Um, I, I so, was going to leave that to Greg. <laughs> absolutely. And Greg, I'm going to get to, to that training side um, from you in a moment here. But while, while we're on the topic of nutrition, um, um, Greg, I'll, Kelly kind of led into this one. Um, th this idea of carb loading, it's something that comes up a lot as people are, are you know, in the week before their race. It's something you see uh, races putting out there, um, different publications putting out there. Is carb loading something that people really need to be focused on? How, how should we think about this idea of carb loading? Well, I mentioned it before. When the research first started, that's where we learned carbohydrate stores are low uh, in the muscles, and maybe that was the reason people were hitting the wall or not able to perform. And so naturally, the scientists started saying, well, what strategies can we use to increase the carbohydrate stores? And that's where this idea of carbohydrate loading, trying to really stuff the muscles with carbohydrate came into play. And then there became this strategy where you would, uh, the beginning of race week, you would have a depletion phase where you would avoid carbohydrates and really trying to get the stores very low. And then the last three days, you really stuff yourself with carbohydrates to really maximally fill those stores. That had a lot of negatives in that, number one, your training suffered because you weren't having any carbohydrates, so you had nothing to fuel in the first few days. You were grumpy all the time, which was no good for anybody that lived with you. And also, it sort of made your running not good, which going into a race, you kind of want to feel confident about your running, not have poor runs. So later, we learned that you don't really have to carbo load, like really overdo it with carbohydrates uh, in the, the week of the race. Really just the last three or four days, as long as you've got a good carbohydrate source within each of your meals, you're going to be fine. The problem people run into is when they avoid carbohydrates or they start missing meals, like Kelly mentioned, sometimes when you travel, you might have a situation where your meals get a little bit off their normal schedule. That can be where people maybe don't have as much carbohydrate stored in their body as they would like, but you don't have to go overboard with the carbohydrate loading. I just think a balanced diet, making sure you have that quality carbohydrate stores in each of your meals going into the race and never get hungry in the last three days before your marathon. Uh, that means you've got to carry stuff with you, make sure you're, you're prepared in case things don't work out. Those are some things on race week I really tell athletes, and usually that takes the pressure off, right? Now you just you eat your normal meal. You just make sure you've got a carbohydrate source. You always have some carbohydrates with you in case you, you start to get hungry. You're going to be fine, uh, and that just takes the pressure off of this idea of I've got to really stuff myself the night before at the pasta dinner to have the fuel. That can cause a lot of negative consequences, GI stress, not eating foods that you're used to eating, eating more than you're used to eating, all those things that can disrupt uh, what is already a kind of a nervous time that night before the race. Anything uh, uh, to add to that, Kelly? Yeah, no, that, I mean, I totally agree 100%. Uh, on all of those points, we we don't the research doesn't really support carbohydrate loading. We don't we don't really recommend that anymore. It's not necessary. Uh, I kind of the way I describe it to most of my clients is keep in mind that your glycogen stores are finite, right? So it's not like the more that we put in, the bigger that store is going to get. You're just topping it off, and you're making sure it stays topped off those three or four days before the race, and especially you know the day before. And then you'll, like Greg said, you'll be fine. As long as you just keep that topped off and keep your blood sugar steady, you'll be fine. 
Because awesome. most um, of the fuel that you need for your race is already stored in your body. Right. You already have it. So you're, you're, I love that idea of topping it off, right? It's not that you're deficient already. And, and Kelly mentioned this before this webinar started. You're also training less. You're tapering down in your training before the race. So you're already not burning as many calories as you were in your normal training. So the carbohydrates that are in your regular diet are going to be filling those stores already. So you really don't have very much left to do as long as you followed a, a decent diet going into those last few days. Right. And if you carbo load, we've got that whole insulin spike and the potential fat gain from it. And so, you know, because what's excess, what you top off your glycogen stores and then you're not running as much. So what's going to happen to the rest of that? And then you don't feel good. I think that runners are very aware of their body composition, their body weight, and they're, they, they feel that meal, whether it's GI distress or extra weight or it just doesn't make them feel good. And the last thing, just like you don't want to have a poor run, the last thing is you don't want to have a poor meal before. You don't want to feel bad because anything that makes you feel bad is going to mess with your psyche, even if it doesn't necessarily impact the next day. Messing with your psyche the night before the race is not something you want to do, right? So definitely. Uh, I think, you know, just based on, I, like I told you guys before, the number of times this question comes up, this last six minutes will be what I'm pointing people to over and over and over again to get both of your uh, perspective on that. Um, just in closing us out, Greg, I just um, had one more for you, just from a training standpoint, you know, the, the week before the race, um, and, and then even more specifically the day or two leading up to the race, what do you recommend people should do in terms of running, um, and then as we talk about the days leading up to the race, just in terms of being on their feet in general. Yeah, I got a few rules for race week. Number one is you've got to rest the body. As Kelly mentioned, you're tapering down, you're resting, uh, but you need to keep the engine revved so you just don't go on vacation and not run. You, you still have to do your runs. Um, it's good to have some intensity still in there, so it's okay to do some lighter sessions of workouts. You don't do as extensive as you did, but it's okay to follow. And that's why most training plans will have one usually kind of faster running session in the last week. Uh, you want to maintain the frequency that you've been running because all of us runners know if we miss a few days of running and then come back to running, we feel terrible. We feel like we've never run before because we've taken our body out of its routine. So I say maintain the frequency that you run. So if you run three days a week, Run three days a week during the race week. That's fine. If you run four, run four. The only caveat to that or exception is if you've got a niggly ache or pain, you might need a little more musculoskeletal rest than take an extra day off. But essentially, just like with our nutrition, we want to maintain our routine that we've been doing. Uh, that works really well. And then you are, you're trying to pull all your resources together to be fresh and excited for race day. And that's why you'll be, even though you're nervous and you might eat out of nerve, nervous energy, you might go to the expo and stay there forever. You and I have been at expos together, Varn, where we've seen people come through first thing in the morning and then you see them again and you see them again, you see them again, and you think, man, I've been here 10 hours and I've seen you every hour for 10 hours. Don't you have a race to run in the morning? <laughs> Shouldn't you get off your feet? So a lot of times it's recognizing you're going to have a lot of nervous energy, but you need to rest, get out and do a run, go to the expo, explore, you know, do a little bit of activity, but make sure you're resting. Don't just eat out of nervousness. Don't be active out of nervousness. Try to be calm, maybe come up with some strategies mentally. If you do all of those things right, and ultimately, if you've had a good plan and maybe if you've got a coach or something, then uh, you will have been told you're ready for the race. You don't need to do anything special for the race. You already have the performance inside of you. So just relax, control as much as you can, and let's just get to the race. It is exciting. It's nervous, but it's, it's fun. It's what you did all the work for. So this is, it should be an exciting time. And, and hopefully you can calm the nerves. And if a runner can kind of get that done over that week, usually they'll, they'll get to the starting line. And once that gun finally sounds, then they're able to just get out of their own way and go and perform. Uh, so the last week, 
uh, at least in my coaching, I'm doing a lot of talking people off the ledge. It's going to be okay, managing nervousness, but really just having a regimen that they can follow from a training standpoint, from a nutrition standpoint, from a logistical standpoint that they've kind of mapped out everything they're going to do leading up to the race. That seems to work really well. Awesome. And um, Greg and Kelly, I know we're uh, pretty close um, on time here, just um, almost running out. Uh, Kelly, I see some wonderful uh, – <laughs> that was what? very great. It's, li it's live. That's, that's what happens. <laughs> so I, I really want to thank you both. Um, I'll say that the number of people on this actually increased over the hours. So you guys obviously – a lot of uh, people were really interested in what you have to say. Um, we didn't have too much time for audience questions, but I figure I just pose one quick one to each of you guys, um, and then we'll wrap it up. So, Kelly, I'll, I'll start with you. This one's from Suzanne. Um, she wants to know, how much protein do you recommend uh, runners take after a long run? Um, and I, I guess for this purpose, we'll stick with your definition of the long run, which you talked about being about 60 to 75 minutes plus. Um, do you have a formula for that? I do. Well, the first thing is, is, you know, that first 30 minute window is really, really important to get in, you know, some liquid protein that the body can use right away. With that, research shows that you don't want to, for a female, you really don't want to go over 30 grams and a male doesn't really want to go over 40 grams because you can't utilize more than that at one time. So it's not like you can take in 100 grams of protein all at once to refuel from that whole long run. After that, you know, I have a formula and a, a chart that I think you're going to share with the people that signed up for the webinar, right? So yep. it kind of just shows, it's like Greg said, you burn an extra 100 calories per mile about. And so after you've refueled that protein, you know, right past the long run, it's kind of looking at that calorie breakdown, subtracting that protein shake and subtracting the, maybe the potential fuel that you've used on the run. So if you've used you can, you know, how much did you use plus the bar or if you used a gel or whatever it is, right? You got to subtract all of that out and then you can just kind of add that into your general macro breakdown throughout the day. So you will need more protein, but you kind of look at it by the calorie breakdown throughout the day of what you need left, if that makes sense. Great. That's helpful. And like Kelly mentioned, I will send out uh, that chart, which will kind of put a bow on the information that she just provided. That'll be sent to you with this uh, video as a follow-up. Um, and Greg, uh, to close it out, I got one for you. So this, this is an interesting question from Kristen. She, she asks, what do you do if an athlete gets sick? Um, she asked specifically during the taper, but I guess just as a general standpoint, you know, leading up to a race, you're working with an athlete, they find they're sick. How, how do you manage that? First thing we have to do is you have to get well, you have to feel better. And so you don't want to stress yourself when you're in the early stages of being sick. That's when the body is most at risk, right? But usually a day or two after, I'm talking about normal illness, obviously, uh, after some light activity actually helps boost the immune system. So you don't stress it when the immune system is super stressed, but a day or two later, usually a run will actually help boost the immune system and you start to feel better. The key thing with athletes is they have to not panic that they're going to lose all their fitness right before the race because you're not. The only thing you might feel is less sort of race sharp. You might feel more sluggish on the runs, mainly because maybe you haven't eaten as much or are not as hydrated because you've been ill. So number one, you're not going to lose all your fitness. It's fine. Number two, don't train hard when you're sick. Just ease, in, ease out of sickness with some running. And if you can just do a little bit of running, that is plenty to maintain your fitness. And the biggest mistake athletes make is like, oh, I need to get in that last big long run that I was going to miss. And it's like, no, don't do that. That's overstressing the body. You're fine. No one workout makes or breaks the training cycle. So be calm, be patient, and just roll with the punches. And I will always say one thing. There are so many examples of, from the Olympic level to us regular runners, of people who got sick before a race and ended up having the best race of their life. Sometimes I think it's because they got more rest. They were worried about their nutrition and their hydration, so they did a better job doing that. And they didn't overtrain in the last week or two before the race. So ultimately, the illness was a blessing in that it helped them get more prepared for the race. So the worst thing you can do is stress about it mentally, overdo the training. It's better to do less training than more training when you have a little bit of an illness. And then just trust that 
all of those runs. I mean, you can look back in your log and count up all of those runs that you've done. That's the body of work that leads to the good performance, not missing a run or two or having a little bit more taper, if you will, than you planned. Don't worry about that. You'll be fine by race day. So in basketball, we have the Michael Jordan flu game, and in the marathon, we have the Greg McMillan flu race <laughs> <laughs> in terms of great performances. Uh, well, Gre Greg and Kelly, I just really want to thank you guys both for your time. That was fantastic. Tons of great information. Um, for everyone in the audience, you will have full access to this uh, replay of the video chat. Um, you'll be getting it by email in just a couple hours, and we'll send um, some additional references out with this. Um, just in closing this out, Kelly, if folks want to – um, get more of your info. You've got a ton of recipes and a bunch of other cool stuff on your blog. How can people uh, continue to stay connected with you? Absolutely. So I run a healthy lifestyle blog that has recipes and sometimes workouts and uh, just health and nutrition information. Um, and my blog is called Hungry Hobby, and you can find it at hungryhobby.net. If you're interested in nutrition counseling, either for sports performance or other potential needs, um, you can find a link to that through the blog, or you can just go directly to my nutrition counseling website, where there is a sports nutrition package there. Um, and that's hungryhobbyrd.com. Fantastic. And uh, these will be sent out in the email, so you guys don't have to commit this to memory. And, and Greg, how about you? Uh, there's tons of ways people can get involved with what you're doing uh, as part of the run team. Uh, you have training plans. Uh, what, are, what are all the stuff that people can get um, at your website and how can they get that info? Well, my website, mcmillanrunning.com, was set up as a resource for runners. So there's a ton of articles and training tools and things that people can access for free to help their training. And then obviously, if they want a little bit more help, I've got training plans on there as well. In fact, uh, my marathon recovery plans are free, so they can go ahead and get started on one of those when they finish their race uh, so they can get a taste of what the, the training system is like. And then we do we have an online training group that in includes coaching from me and a training plan and connection with other athletes that are training for the same thing, all the way up to having uh, me as your personal online coach. So uh, sort of a, a wide variety of services available for athletes from a lot of free stuff to some higher touch things, whatever the athlete needs, basically. I, like Kelly, I'm just here trying to help people achieve their goals and everybody might need something different, but whatever you need, I'm, I'm happy to help if I can. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, I just encourage you to check both those out. Kelly and Greg have been uh, great resources, but this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the information that both of them possess. Um, so check those out. And I just want to thank you both again. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for uh, spending an hour with us. It's like Greg, you know, with me, it's, I ask you for an hour. It's always a little bit longer. So appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> but, uh, but thank you guys so much. Really enjoyed it. And uh, we'll talk to everyone out there soon. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a great day.